Cora B. Gallery has been making a name for herself in the South for her colorful and iconic portraits. Her pieces are all designed to not only show off the subject of the painting, but to also bring a beautiful and exciting piece of artwork into your home. Her new portrait series, Icons and Idols, showcases some of the most memorable faces in music. Each original portrait is hand-painted and designed to showcase their most iconic music and images. These paintings have the most famous faces in music, depicting everyone from Louis Armstrong and the Beatles to Billie Eilish and Beyonce. All of her portraits are also available in 8x8 inch art prints that make the perfect gift for the music lover in your life this Christmas. Use our code CYA15 at CoraBGallery.com for 15% off your first order. Again, that is code CYA15 at CoraBGallery.com for 15% off your first order. Hey guys, I'm Alexis, and this is the Check Your Aesthetic Podcast. Couldn't even get through that entire thing without laughing. Um, so it's just me today without Katie. Um, she had some things going on, so I just said, you know what? I'm going to take over for today. Just do it myself. Um, <laughs> but we will be having Amanda from That Manda Girl on later today. Um, she is going to talk about uh her children's book that she created and published um I have been following her for actually quite a while um I remember I found her account I think it was 2020 um and I just immediately followed I love how bright and colorful her page is if any of you know me you know I like some rainbows um but yeah, I'm really excited. I, as I'm recording this, I have not met with her yet. Um, switching it up a little bit and recording before I talk to Amanda. Um, so I don't know exactly what we will be talking about, but I know that it's going to be a great episode. So you guys should keep listening. Um, wow. I have not recorded by myself in a while. And I also have not ever recorded with video by myself. So I'm just looking at myself. You know what I'm going to do? Move myself. Now I can't see myself anymore. And I think that that's really going to help me because usually I just look at Katie, but with it just being me, I'm just looking at myself and then getting self-conscious. So, you know, I think that it's a better idea if I just can't even look at myself. Anyways, um, what do I even talk about? <laughs> I don't even know. Um, I guess I can do a little highs and lows or I can do a little update. Um, I finished the quarter for SCAD um, a couple weeks ago. And so I've had um, the past, I'd say like week and a half off. Um, and then I have until I think, I believe it's January 5th is when I start the next quarter. And of course me being me, always perfectionist. And so I was like, oh, six week break. I'm gonna like, you know, bust my complete ass and just get so many products finished and have a huge launch in January and like whatever, whatever. But I think what I've realized is that because I'm such a perfectionist and because I'm doing full-time grad school and working at East Smarter and doing the podcast, I am running like 24 seven most of the time. So I think I've needed to give myself a bit of the, a break. Over the weekend, I let myself sleep until like 11 because I ended up not being able to fall asleep until like 3 a.m. the morning before. And that was like a huge thing for me. I feel like I almost cried when I looked like woke up and look at, looked at the clock. Um, Cause usually if I sleep in, I totally beat myself up like the rest of the day for not getting up on time. Um, so yeah, I've just kind of been giving myself a break. Um, but I am hoping, I think, I think part of my, one of my toxic traits is that I just like do too much too fast. I mean, I graduated from undergrad in three years and I honestly, when I first told my parents about SCAD and grad school, originally I wanted to graduate <laughs> early for that too. And they were like, that's a bad idea. And I was like, no, you're wrong. And then I thought about it more and I was like, yeah, you're right. Um, 
but I totally bring that into like everything. So when I first made a list of stuff that I wanted to create, I had probably like 20 things that I wanted to create. Bad idea, super bad idea. Um, so I think what I might do is like um, have lower expectations for myself and maybe try to create like three. And then if I can create those three, then I can always add more on later. So really the point of what I've just been saying for the past three minutes is give yourself a break. Everybody deserves it, especially this time. I believe this is going out. I believe this episode is going out the week before our Christmas special. Um, so I think everyone in the entire world right now deserves to just take some, take a breath, take some time, give yourself a break um, because pretty much if you are a social media manager or if you are an influencer or a small business owner, everybody I know pushes themselves very hard. And I mean, even if you're not one of what a list that I just said, everybody just in general, I think um, has high expectations for themselves. So take a break, um, me included. That is also a message to myself. Cause I know, I know that I say these things and part of the reason that I say this out loud on the podcast is to try and hold myself accountable, but we all know that's not going to happen. Um, so I think just saying it hopefully will help me and hopefully help you. Wow. I'm just going in circles at this point, saying the same thing over and over again. I love that for me. Um, do you guys hear that? I don't even know what that was. It sounded like a plane or something. Um, it's also just getting so dark so much of the time. I wake up and it is pitch black. And then around mm, 3.45, it starts getting dark. It's like fully, it's four o'clock right now and it's fully dark. Um, it's also been just very rainy, not very good weather. And to be honest, that has been getting me down. So I think that also, you know, seasonal depression is a very real thing. So giving yourself a break for that as well is always helpful. Um, but like I said, next week, I believe if I am, if I have the schedule right in my head, which very well might not be true, but if I'm correct, this episode is going out before our Christmas special and Katie and I are genuinely so excited. Um, we haven't done a, an episode, just the two of us in so long. And I think that that's going to be really fun and exciting just to have some time, the two of us to create or create, yeah, I guess create, film, record um, an episode. And I believe what we landed on is we are going to do on the stories, we're gonna post um, something so that you guys can give us some of your unpopular, unpopular opinions. And then, um, and we're gonna react to them. And then another one where um, on the Facebook group, uh, people are going to be submitting their um, like kind of Karen stories because you guys have been asking for another Karen story episode. So we're, we're kind of going to do like a Christmas holiday uh, Karen episode kind of holiday edition. So that will be very fun. But yeah, I guess I don't really have much more to say without Katie. I don't really have much because I kind of went on about my giving myself too much of a hard time for a while and that's pretty much honestly what's it's the only thing that's been going on in my life is that I've been trying to take a break and also at the same time trying to create products so those two things don't really go hand in hand oh wait yes okay I am also <laughs> I am going to New York City for Christmas not actual Christmas it'll be a week before Christmas um, I'm leaving the 15th and I will be getting back, I believe, the 22nd. And I am so excited. I have been to New York City before a couple times, but I have never been during the holidays. And I am so excited for that. I am excited to see the tree and excited just to see the city um, all snowy and everything. I've been, I've been in March and that was like the closest to winter that I've ever been in New York City. Every other time was... Um, in like the summer or the spring. So I'm excited to see it um, snowy. And of course, anybody that lives in New England knows or near New England knows that March just means slush. 
not actual snow. So I think it'll be very different. Um, but yeah, that's really the only updates for me. And definitely stick around because I think it's going to be a fun episode. And let's just get into it. Hi, Amanda. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Wow. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored to be here. I love your podcast so much. So this is like a dream for me. Not going to oh lie. My oh my <laughs> God. I'm so honored. Um, I was just, I just recorded um, my intro before we started recording. And I was saying how I've actually been following you for like so long, I feel like. And I, I remember, I think honestly, when we started the podcast, I was like, we should have Amanda on. And then it just took like this freaking long to finally happen. But yes, I love how so excited. small and supportive the Instagram community can be at times. Obviously, there's pockets of social media that are not supportive and very competitive. Well, yes, of course. But yeah, I've, I've loved the vibes you both have been giving off. So, <laughs> oh, thank you so much. That is, that is honestly our like number one priority that we don't seem like we think too highly of ourselves because we truly just do not. Um, <laughs> but I also, I also think that you like definitely got it right that this sector of the community is very supportive. And I really am happy that that's kind of where we've sectioned ourselves. Um, Mm -hmm. but so for anyone that does not know who you are, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes. Okay. So my name is Amanda Young. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the creative behind that Amanda girl, which initially started as a fashion and lifestyle space Mm -hmm. that I also shared my animal training photos from, because I used to be an animal trainer and zookeeper Mm -hmm. and eventually transitioned to this pocket of mental health advocacy. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I have an Instagram, I have my own mental health podcast and that's where we've landed is like mental health now. (laughs) I love that so much. Um, So why don't you talk about how you kind of transitioned from, like you said, like influencing content into then creating um, or like kind of niching down and then creating the children's book? Yes. So it was a long and twisty journey, which I feel like is how (laughs) I, you know, let me, let me take you back. Um, So many of us in this field are exactly like that. Right. Oh, so I had an Instagram since the app came out, didn't realize that it was something you could monetize, like actually Mm -hmm. monetize. And the big joke in my family is that I always find a way to monetize my hobbies. Like I'm just a serial entrepreneur and Mm -hmm. whatever new hobby I would start, I'd be like, Ooh, I can make money off this. So eventually I figured out that Instagram was an avenue for that. And I thought in order to be successful, I had to be doing the same thing that every other successful white influencer was doing. And so I did the fashion game and I was like, Ooh, Amazon finds and this and this. And I liked fashion. I always thought I had decent fashion, but Mm -hmm. I quickly realized that I was following trends and it wasn't really what I was passionate about, you know? And so I eventually sat down and kind of realigned priorities of, okay, I want people to meet me in real life and know that that's exactly who I am online and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of transitioned to sharing a lot about the animals I was working with. At the current time, I was a marine mammal trainer. I worked at SeaWorld and worked with dolphins and sea lions and killer whales. And so I was using my Instagram to kind of peel back the veil and give people a different perspective on what it's like to work with these animals. And so I was being really open and honest. And in the midst of that, I actually got laid off from that job. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I was faced with this moment of, am I going to keep up the like perfect highlight real life? Or am I actually going to start sharing and be authentic with like Mm -hmm. what's actually going on? And so that was kind of the first time that I realized, oh, okay. So I'm struggling with my mental health. It seems like a lot of other people are struggling with their mental health. Maybe this is something I'm passionate about. Was this during COVID that that happened? No. So that was a perfect setup. This was a year almost to the day that I got furloughed then during COVID. So I got laid off from this dream job, made a couple pivots, then got furloughed a year later because of COVID and was like, okay, yeah. So here we are yet again. Our mental health is struggling. 
we're still like in a job that we're not passionate about. We work all day to then come home and work all day on Instagram. So right. something's got to change. Right. And so in the beginning of 2021, I left my zookeeping job and started working for my brand, which is like, what? <laughs> Full time. <laughs> what is like, what? <laughs> when I tell right. people, they're like, what do you do? And I'm like, I run my platform full time. And they're like, what does what that mean? That? <laughs> yeah. Then I, I settle and I'm like, oh, I work in social media consulting or social media marketing. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I do have clients, but through all of that, I realized that I'm about being authentic. I want to share the nitty gritty. Yes. I love colorful rainbow, all those things. But mm-hmm. my tagline is that life is not all sunshine and rainbows. And we should be talking about those moments when it's not too, and it should be a reflection Absolutely. of our whole life, not just the highlight reel. So that's kind of like the the long-winded version of how we got here. (laughs) I love that so much. So from that kind of mental health niche that you decided to go down, what inspired you from that to then create um, the children's book that you did? Yeah. So again, I had this polling that half of me was animals, but half of me really wanted to use my voice in some way. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately being tied to different corporations and companies, as we all know, your voice isn't always as loud as it can be because Mm -hmm. there are speculations and there are things you can't talk about and stuff like that. And so I told myself that if I was going to leave the field, then I was going to find a way to continue telling stories of these animals and the people that worked with them. And when I was approached with the opportunity to write this book, granted, it was something that had been on my vision board for like years and years. It was always Mm -hmm. that it was like, yeah, that'll never happen, but I'm Mm going to say that I'm manifesting it, you know? Right. And I was approached in the spring of this year and made the connection with the publisher and the person that I co-authored with. And she pitched to me, Hey, we should make it about loosely you and the animals mm-hmm. that you worked with. And I was like, no, I don't want to do <laughs> right. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. And she's like, no, I think it would be cool. You have so many stories and we can find a way to pull in mental health and pull in inclusivity and all the things mm-hmm. that are, you are so passionate about as a perfect topic for a children's book series. And I was like, wait, you said series. I thought we were. <laughs> And she really just opened my eyes that there's this world of possibilities. So once I got connected with her and her publishing company, yeah, we kind of took off running and the book got published. It's called Jumo the Unicorn, Manda's Magical Zoo. So this, the series is Manda's Magical Zoo, which my name mm-hmm. is Amanda. So, you know, not for off there. And <laughs> yeah, it got published September 30th. And as of today in December, it's already hit number one best selling on Amazon for its like section of children. That is book, so amazing. Which at the beginning of this year, I would have never even thought that author would be in my email signature. And now right. to just like have this book that's doing incredible. I'm just like, what? <laughs> what? <Right. laughs> yeah, seriously. So when, what, uh, when was the day that she reached out to you and like, how long was that process of creating from like ideation to then publishing? Yeah. So it was in March of this year. So March, 2021, my sister actually made the connection. She, uh, worked with my co-author Melody, who also owns Mm -hmm. a publishing liaison company. So she works with people who want to self-publish, but don't exactly know how to go about it because it is a very complicated process and sure you can watch a bunch of YouTube videos on how to get it done, but right. depending on the way you want to go, it, it, there's so many different ways to do it. And so mm-hmm. she has this publishing liaison company called the publishing room. And so we connected, we had our first like inspiration meeting in March and initially we we're going to go the route of a rhino that woke up the first day of the pandemic and no one was there at the zoo and like how to problem solve through guests not being there anymore. But by the time we were writing it, we were like, this story's overdone. LOL. We thought the pandemic was going to be over also. Like it had been a year and we were like, this is done. (laughs) I don't know. I feel like we're not, we're just rushing. And it was, it was kind of feeling forced. And so we changed gears and started writing this new story about a rhino who thinks he's a unicorn. And as soon as we got on that new topic, we wrote the whole story within a month. So I would say we started 
that story may by june the story was done we sent it to the editor so end of june and then we started illustrations for july august and then we were able to have it published september 30th so start to finish it was fast it was quick yeah i was not expecting it to go that quickly Mm -hmm. but it was a very smooth process and like i said she walked me through the entire thing right i thought like in order to write a book, you had to have this like really nice notebook paper or this like secret, you know, (laughs) right. Yeah. For word document, we wrote the whole book in Google docs and it was so cool because it was collaborative and I could see her edits and comments on what I was writing and vice versa. And Mm -hmm. even though Melody and I co-authored, she really gave me full reign on the story. And Mm. she was like, I'm here just to like give you credibility, but like, girl, this is your thing. I'll help you where you want help. But you take the wheel. I was like, okay. <laughs> that sounds so fun. I feel like that's mm-hmm. just like an amazing process, a process. And especially to be able to, I feel like self-publishing. Um, I actually, for my thesis for undergrad, I ended up um, creating a children's book. I didn't publish it or anything, um, but I like created like a physical copy of it. And I looked into self-publishing and it just seemed like such a huge process that I just was like, not willing to take under for like just like a final project basically um yeah but yeah it seems like having those um just like someone to help guide you along I feel like that's such a nice thing to have and make that process go a little bit smoother it was and you know everyone talks about these big mega publishing companies but when you break it down with royalties they take a majority of the money right. that you're making yeah. we're working with these smaller like think about small businesses and how we like to shop small same thing with these smaller publishing publishing companies and her and i were able to split 50-50 royalties because we co-authored and that is unheard of and she had been through this process, had multiple children's book that she had published. And there's so many unspoken nuances in the publishing world, especially now that, you know, the mega house Amazon has made it so easy to publish just like Amazon takes over everything. They've made it so easy to do everything, but these smaller bookstores don't want to carry your book if you've published it through Amazon really because you sold out and published mm-hmm. it through Amazon instead of going through these the other areas kind of mm-hmm. way and so mm-hmm. she knew that the way to get around it and we could publish it through Ingram Sparks but then have it sold on Amazon, on Amazon. yeah and so there's ways to where your ISBN number, which is what makes your book unique. You can purchase it somewhere else instead of getting it on Amazon. And even though you've gone through Amazon, no one knows, like there's this whole dance that you have to do. Right. It's almost like having like a separate brand for your book, not having it with that Amazon like tagline. Yes. Yes. Interesting. That is very, Mm -hmm. and I feel like, I feel like going through a publisher, that is something that they would know that like, if you are self-publishing, of course, you're not going to know that until you, until you do like you know, extensive research, which by that point, you might as well just get a publisher. Yeah. yeah. So that's amazing. So you talked about um, a little bit about the illustration process. Did you illustrate it yourself or was that also a collaborative effort? Um, and so, how did you, how was that? Yeah. I did not illustrate it myself. Everyone okay. was like very supportive. They're like, you could. And I was like, no, I, <laughs> no, mostly because I'm learning to know my limits and knew that I had already spread myself thin with a podcast, a brand, a book, clients, you know, it was already getting to that point. Could I have possibly, but the illustrator that we found is incredible and I will never, I will never think about illustrating everything because now that we found him, so that process, yeah, it was, it was wild. We actually found him on Fiverr which really that yes. is actually so funny isn't that wild and fiverr is such a cool site for anyone that doesn't know it's basically like online dating but for creatives I you know explanation. Like you create your profile you show what services you offer you have different packages and people can like bid on them and 
So what we did is we came up with a mock cover in Canva and I (laughs) had this like idea in my brain of the pink haired zookeeper Manda and the rhino and we wanted a rainbow horn. So I'm like very hodgepodging with like cartoon clip art that I found online. Like, Mm -hmm. Hey, this is what I want it to look like. So what we did is we purchased front covers from, I think we did four different artists and Mm. that way we could pay them for their work. Right. One image was anywhere between like 25 to $50. And we were like, okay, let's just do the front cover. We'll kind of pick. And it was so cool that we gave the same image, the same explanation to every single person, but they all came back with their different style. And that was neat to see all these different interpretations of our story that we were presenting. And so we found our illustrator, his name is Fair Peralta, and he just had this whimsical cartoony flair and Mm -hmm. all of the colors in his previous work and the color palette and scheme that he was using essentially matched with all of my brand colors. And instantly Mm -hmm. I knew that we were going to sync and gel so well just by the work that he had put in his portfolio. That's so important. Yeah, because I'm being a creative, I'm already picky and I already know, you know, bare minimum what I can produce. And granted, it's nothing that close to what he created, but I'm picky and it's okay to be picky, especially when you're putting something out into the world. And, you know, the most powerful thing you have is your name and you know, that when you're putting something in your name on it, I don't know, I'm just really big about putting my best foot no, forward 100%. in all ways. So yeah, definitely. I feel like that I, I love, honestly, just from like a designer's point of view, I so much appreciate that you did the little hodgepodge Canva thing. <laughs> I think yeah. that that's, that's so helpful. I've done a few um, book covers and I think that like, and you know, even like, you know, podcast stuff and like logo stuff. I think mm-hmm. sometimes people have like, um, an image in their mind, but they don't have the, um, you know, the want or the ability to go out and actually do it. But I think that, you know, even if it's just Canva and finding like source images and, you know, just inspiration and giving that to someone and being like, this is kind of what I want it to like, look like, but can you make it look professional? I think that's yes. so helpful for everyone involved because then, you know, it's more, much more likely that it's going to turn out how you want rather right. than trying to make, you know, someone read your mind. So I appreciate that so much. Um, so through this whole process of, you know, the ideation and writing and il- finding the illustrator, working mm-hmm. with him, publishing and everything, um, even marketing, if you want, what are some unexpected struggles that you have had through the process? Yes. So for me personally, with my animal background, it was really important for me to make sure that the animals we were illustrating were as anatomically correct as they could be. (laughs) Granted, you know, granted they're cartoon cartoon. animals, (laughs) but the biggest like bane of my existence, having even with the Lion King, the Lion King as a kid and growing up, they animated a rhino that does not live in Africa. And it was just the bane of my existence that these animators Mm -hmm. just like didn't do that extra bit of research, you know, and finally with the new Lion King that came out, they corrected it and it was all animals that were correct. But so that was something that uh, was really important to me. So there were definitely some revisions and I eventually had to send over actual photos of the animals labeled because our illustrator, there was a little bit of a language barrier as well too. Mm -hmm. Um, His first language is not English, which totally fine. And, um, but there was just some language barrier there. And so I eventually labeled all the photos of the animals. Like this is an Okapi because most people don't know what an Okapi looks like. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm writing about these animals, but so that was definitely something that we had a problem solve through. Uh, the other thing was figuring out the hardback because a lot of people just go the ebook and paperback route. Mm-hmm. But going the hardback route, it took a lot longer than we expected. Mm-hmm. It was worth it because the quality products that we got is incredible. And I really feel like giving people those options to have a hardcover. Yeah. Um, it was important to me. My husband is actually the one that was like really pushing for it. He's like, you need a hardback. Mm-hmm. Like, okay. Uh, so that took a lot longer. It actually did not come out until a month after the book really? had already been okay. published. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But 
in my opinion, it was, it worked out marketing wise right. because everyone's oh, buying the paper that. back. Yep. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, hey, the hardcover just came out. So I was like, right. oh, now I got to buy that. So honestly, you know, depending on the way you take things in stride, it worked for our benefit actually, mm-hmm. which was great. And then as far as marketing, we chose not to create a separate Instagram or anything like that. Again, because with all of the things that I was already actively doing, I just felt like it would stretch too thin, but we really utilized my platform platform. that I had already Mm -hmm. built. And even just utilizing the fact that I have a podcast and I can do Mm -hmm. my own ads. That was something I never thought about that. Like, Mm -hmm. oh, I can do my own ads. Weird. Okay. And just spreading the word, getting people excited. A great idea that uh, our publisher had was to create test readers. So we had 30 people that read the book early Mm. and by signing up to read the book, then they acknowledged that they would write a review. And so then the day the book was published, we already had 30 reviews on Amazon, which set us up for huge success. And that was something that I had never thought of doing, but Mm -hmm. it made worlds different for us for sure. So you think with um, the book and I guess just Amazon products in general, having the reviews really helped for sales? Yes, for sure. One thing that Melody was my co-author and uh, publisher was really strong and adamant about was getting to 50 reviews. And so Mm. our goal was to get to 50 reviews pre-holidays. So like December one. And so we were really pushing hard to get to 50 because once you get to 50 reviews on Amazon, Amazon will start suggesting that product as, oh, product similar. So if someone's looking at a book about a rhino, they're going to then suggest my book or they're looking at a zoo animal book. It's going to suggest that, but you have to make it to 50 reviews before that point. Very and, interesting. Yeah. And so setting us up for success with the ARC readers and then having those dedicated 30 reviews. Granted, Mm -hmm. we didn't tell them they had to be five-star reviews. They were honest reviews. They weren't getting paid at all. It was just, Hey, you're signing up out of the goodness of your heart to review this book for me. And then from there, people were more likely to buy it because if you think about it, I read reviews on every single thing I purchase. And the one that has more reviews, especially Amazon. Yeah. It's the one I'm going to buy. So that was definitely something that I would suggest to anyone make sure it doesn't have to be 30, but make sure you have, you know, like your core people that are going to support you utilize that. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so do you have any, like, do people continually review the book on Amazon? And do you have something that like, you know, incentivizes them to continue doing that? Or is it really just, they see that other people have and they do so themselves? Yeah. So the neat thing about Amazon is Amazon, you can review it even if you haven't read the book. Mm -hmm. which is interesting, but then Amazon also has a verified purchase tag. So if someone has bought the book and then Amazon reminds you to review it, it's going to show up as verified purchase. So our ARC readers do not have the verified purchase under them, but it's very clear that they've read the book (laughs) off of that. Um, I do, I did some giveaways where once Mm -hmm. the hardcover came out and we were 15 reviews away from hitting that 50 mark, I said, if you screenshot your review between now and December one, you could win a signed hardcover. And so I did incentivize it. And honestly, I think, again, the power of building that community behind you and being open and authentic, they had been with me on this journey since March and teasing it and talking about it. And they were excited and proud of me and for me. And so it was incredible just to feel the support from my community, you know, supporting me mm-hmm. in that, but that it so is, much. it is wild seeing people that I have no idea who they are reviewing the book. And I'm just like, Oh, <laughs> oh so like people this. who are my <laughs> grandma are buying this book. Okay, cool. <laughs> so funny. Um, so what advice, if anyone is listening and is thinking about publishing a book, um, whether that's by themselves or through a publisher, what advice would you give to them? I would say just go for it. Honestly, I think the biggest thing with us as creatives, we hold ourselves back thinking that someone's already done it and it's already saturated market, but it's not, there can never be enough children's stories, especially with 
our wave of a generation that cares about inclusivity and Mm -hmm. cares about human rights and climate change and all these things, you have your own unique twist on something and Mm -hmm. the world is wide enough to continue talking about these topics. And so Mm -hmm. I wouldn't let your fears of being like someone else hold you back. Mm -hmm. And again, there can't ever be enough people talking about some of these topics and that would say, go for it and find the people that will support you. Mm -hmm. And don't be afraid of no, just know that no might be a little revision and, you know, (laughs) revise and Mm -hmm. carry on, you know? Yeah. I think that's great advice just in general, honestly, past just publishing a book. Um, so do you have, I know you said that, um, it is a series. So what are the the plans for any future books? Yes. So (laughs) I actually just wrote the second one. It's (gasps) wild. Yeah. It's written. And I, I'm aiming for a spring publish date just because I want to keep going on the holiday wave right now. Everyone's buying Mm -hmm. the book for the holiday season and Christmas Mm -hmm. lists, which is why we published it in September to kind of ride that wave. Mm -hmm. Um, It's this weird dance where everyone's begging for book two, but I don't want to stomp on book one's success. And so I'm trying to find that balance of it hasn't been too long to where you've forgotten about it, but it's still fresh in your mind. But right. book two is written. And what's neat is with the series, we kind of jumped in halfway through. So you jump into Jun- Jumo the Unicorn and you've already met these main characters. And one of the main characters, Manda, has this ability to talk to her animals and they talk back to her. Mm-hmm. And so reading this book, a lot of the feedback we got from kids was, well, how can how did she know she could talk to animals? Is she the only one? And that was the goal is to get you asking these questions, then set up for book two, which actually is the pre is the pre. pre. Yeah. Yep. So it talks about how Amanda became a zookeeper, how she got her whistle, how she Mm. learned to talk to these animals. So yeah, it's cool. But yes, book two is written. It's in the process. Actually, I just sent it off to the editor uh, on Friday. So Wow. Yeah. It's going quicker now that I know the whole process and now right. that I'm confident in it's okay if the editor changes things and says no to some things. Now mm. that I'm confident in that process. I literally wrote it in one day. I just like brain vomited. And you also okay. have the, the illustrator. So you can probably kind of imagine yeah. like what things would look like. And I bet that's just kind of like an easier, like yes. aspect. Cause For I'm sure. a very visual person. I need to think of how things will look. Before, yes. Well, and that brings up that brings up a very interesting thing, storyboarding. So with Mm -hmm. it being a children's book and with literally every page being illustrated and animated, we had a storyboard. So first the story's written, then you have to break it up into pages, but you have to break the pages up into sentences that make sense together. That would encompass a whole thought that would then become a picture. Yeah. And so it was extra, extra challenging to make sure that thoughts weren't crossing over pages and is this going to be a two page spread or a one page spread and then having to draw my stick figures of these characters (laughs) per page so that he Mm -hmm. knew like okay this is what I'm thinking (laughs) Mm -hmm. and also I feel like it being a children's book also means that like you have to have that simplicity that they can like kind of how you said that two messages don't cross really a lot of that is because it's a children's book so you don't want you want them to look at a page and because they can't read you want them to be able to understand kind of around what the story is saying at that moment and for the illustrations to be distracting enough that while their parents are reading the book they're not already (laughs) trying to flip the page yes it is a dance it is a dance for sure and something that I definitely learned with the first book after reading it to classrooms that It was on a touch too long. And so with this second book, again, revising, learning, I'm I'm learning that I can cut it down a little bit. And yeah, that dance of, you know, just adapting to the story. (laughs) Amazing. I definitely need to get one for my little brother. He's going to turn two in in March. He definitely would flip through the pages though. Even if it's (laughs) a very interesting image, if after two seconds, he's- 
he's done. He's ready. Yeah. The age range that we're looking at is like a K through three or four. So it's a good book to be read to. And then the words are easy enough to where when you are starting to read, you're able Mm. to read it. Yeah. That's a really good idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you want to move into some random questions? (gasps) Yeah. Okay. I'm ready. Yes. Okay. (laughs) So the first one is kind of on, on brand, on theme. What is, or was your favorite children's book as a kid? Ooh, okay. I really loved The Rainbow Fish. Gee, wonder why. That makes so much sense. (laughs) (laughs) I just loved the idea that won the colors. I loved the texture and the glittery scale that Mm -hmm. I'm just a very, like, I like to touch things and feel things. Mm -hmm. Um, And so the glittery scale of that book, I loved, but just the overarching message of you can do everything right and have all great things, but if you don't have friends, where are you? So, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, that makes a lot of sense. And I feel like that inspired your page, (laughs) you know, (laughs) like subconsciously. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Maybe. (laughs) Um, so for mine, I literally just had to Google it because I forgot what they were called. Um, which is stupid because literally the title is part of why I liked it. (laughs) But so my aunt, when I was a little kid had a Rottweiler and she was obsessed with me and she would like basically protect me of like from my, my whole family was like perfectly fine to me. Yet if I was taking a nap, she'd like growl at them because I was taking a nap and I was like her little princess. Um, but my grandpa who was also basically myself and my grandpa were my aunt's dog's favorite people. Um, and my grandpa's name was Carl and there were these, uh, children's books called good dog carl and it's a rottweiler oh and so when i was a little kid i thought that my family wrote those books because it was a rottweiler named carl um so yeah that was my favorite little series and i believe because my grandpa was german and i have this memory that we had a version in german but i definitely think that that was like just maybe my grandma reading it to me in german but that is so Definitely. cool. Yeah, but yeah, but that is kind of niche, but my favorite. Okay, and then this one, this episode will be coming out, I believe, a week before the holiday episode. Okay. So this is more of a holiday themed question. Ooh, okay. So it is, what is your favorite Christmas or just gift in general that you've ever given to someone? Mm. So I'm really big on gifting experiences Mm -hmm. instead of just gifts. Mm -hmm. Um, Gifts are cool, but even growing up as a kid, like they lose, lose their interest in them. And so one of my favorite like experiences that I've given someone is I like it. It's not with my husband, but it was a previous person that I dated (laughs) sorry, babe, but I created (laughs) this whole like scavenger hunt and like favorite, all of our favorite fast food restaurants. And it was this whole like perfect picnic idea. And yeah, granted, I like couldn't afford much back then because we were in high school, but yeah, I was so proud. And it like ended, it was this whole scavenger hunt. And then it ended with this like cheesy scrapbook that I made him of like all our moments together but yeah I just was really proud of myself for how like thoughtful that was back then Mm -hmm. even as a little youngster so Mm -hmm. okay you just reminded me with a scrapbook I had I literally I was going through my google drive a few weeks ago and getting rid of some of my old like stuff and I found this cringe google presentation that I had because I was gonna make Austin like a scrapbook or something and I had like it was from like 2013 I think or like 2014 it had like screenshots from like texts that we had sent and like Mm -hmm. winter ball pictures I love it it was just (laughs) so cringe it was like oh this is painful to look at um but my favorite gift actually I have not given it yet because it's for my mom for Christmas this year Ooh. and so mom if you are listening please stop um but I got this actually which I think that this is one of the best like concepts of gifts is when you're not planning to buy something and then you see something for someone and you're like I should get that yeah I think that that is like 
for at least for like I really love giving gifts and I think that that's like my favorite time that I like I think of someone but anyways I was out with my one of my best friends and I found this book that said like letters to mom and there's 12 there's 12 prompts in like different situations so I still haven't done it I need to get on it but (laughs) I have to write 12 letters and it's like my my favorite memory of us or I think of you when um like I'm I want, I've always wanted to tell you or like some, like something like that. And you can also, so you like write them and then you package them up and put like a little sticker on it. And then you can write when they're supposed to open it. And since there's 12, I'm going to do everyone on the 25th of every month. So then by the next year, then she'll like still have letters for next oh, year. I love yeah. that. Oh my yeah. goodness. I think my goal is always every single Christmas to make my mom cry. And this year I already know that like, oh. I don't have to, I don't have to worry. Yep. I already, Mission accomplished. I know, I know it will. <laughs> I've got it in a bag this year. Uh. Um, okay. So Amanda, do you want to go ahead and plug all of your stuff and the book and everything else? Sure. So you can find me anywhere online at that Amanda girl my website, all my social accounts, my email, all of that at that man, a girl, <laughs> my podcast is in the mental health space again. So I interview guests and we talk about moments when life is not sunshine and rainbows, but that podcast mm-hmm. is titled sunshine and rainbows, you know, on <laughs> and yes, the book is called Jumo, the unicorn part of the Amanda's Magical Zoo series. You can find that online at Barnes and Noble and Amazon. You are in Barnes and Noble. That is the coolest thing that I Girl, not in not at the store yet. Enough people okay, so but online. online. And then if enough people buy it, then it can be carried in store. But there are okay. some local bookstores here in Tampa that also carry it in store as well too. Yeah. The so goal guys, if I'm, you want if you want to buy the book, go to Barnes and Noble. Yep, so yep. we can get that That's one. That <laughs> and if you so amazing. if you like it, throw us a review. That would be amazing. <laughs> yes, please, please leave a review. <laughs> so, on on topic, uh, thank you guys so much for listening. Be sure to leave us also a rating and review, or mm-hmm. on wherever you listen to your podcasts, and subscribe to keep up with our weekly episodes. Hey, I did pretty good on Katie's part for never doing it. Uh, follow us on TikTok at Check Your Aesthetic. And over on Instagram at Check Your Aesthetic Podcast and our post of personal accounts messed up on my own part. Katie Creative Co., AlexisAdams.co, and that Amanda Girl. Does that have, uh, yes, it is that underscore Amanda underscore girl. Yes, yes, it is. But if you search that Amanda Girl, yeah, if you search, I'm yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, she, she'll pop right up. Okay. So thank you, Amanda, for coming on again. And we will talk to you next week. Bye, guys.